Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. Those who have been following along this month know that we've been celebrating amazing women in science, exploration, conservation, uh, and adventure all month long. So we're going to continue things rolling, and we're going to meet Jenny in just a moment. But before we do, I'm going to take a quick screen share. We're going to look at National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive, and we're going to get a feel for where all the classrooms are joining us live from today. So just give me a moment here to share my screen. That should be going now. All right, so this red X, this is me in Alora, Ontario here in Canada. And if I start to back out a little bit, we'll see some of our classrooms start to come into focus. So we've got a classroom joining us in Bradford, another just outside uh, of North Bay. Uh, if we go out a little bit further, you can see a couple of classrooms in New Jersey, a classroom in Virginia. Uh, we should have a classroom in Oklahoma joining us, a few classrooms in Alabama. And if we go a little further south, you can see that we have Jenny joining us in Florida. <laughs> so let me end that screen share now. And as I'm doing that, I just want to remind any classrooms who are tuning in live via YouTube that you can still get in on the action. On the right side of the screen, you'll see a chat sidebar. You can use that to let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, send us in some questions and we'll work those in. And of course, any classrooms tuning in today, whether live or on YouTube, uh, feel free to take some pictures, post them on Twitter with the hashtag explore classroom tag at Nacho Education because we love to see classrooms in action. All right, so very excited to have Jenny Adler joining us today. Jenny's a conservation photographer, a cave diver, and a National Geographic Explorer. Her work as a photographer is informed by her scientific background. So she uses her imagery to communicate science and conservation. So she has a degree in marine biology from Brown University. She also worked as a biologist for the US Geological Survey. And she's also uh, working on her PhD at the University of Florida. So she specializes in underwater photography, photojournalism, and science communication. And we're really excited to steal Jenny's time again. It's always fun to see some of her amazing photos from the springs that she dives in around Florida. And then of course, we have gonna have tons of questions from our live classrooms. So Jenny, it's so great to have you joining us today. And we're excited uh, to get started. Thank you so much, Joe. All right, so hi everyone. I am super excited to be back on here and talking to everyone. As, as Joe said, I'm, I'm down really far south, I guess, compared to everyone else in Florida. Um, it's been surprisingly hot here the past couple days, um, but I know I, I shouldn't rub that in too much because people up north have been texting me pictures of this snow. So um, yeah, I moved down to Florida about eight years ago to work as a biologist, and I was planning on staying for maybe a year and then moving back home to Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, and then apparently eight years have gone by. So I ended up, like Joe said, working on my PhD at the University of Florida and staying largely because of the freshwater springs. So I finished up last May and now I've been working as a freelance photographer. And a lot of people think that's maybe kind of confusing how you would go from being in grad school to being a photographer. So I wanna tell you guys a little bit about that today. Um, so you can learn about, you know, if you wanna be a scientist, you don't always just have to go into academia or research and there are other paths that you can take if you do decide to go into science. So I wanna share with you guys a little bit about uh, photojournalism and conservation photography. And because I'm a photographer, I'm gonna switch my screen over to show you guys some pictures. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll put my face back on so we can um, I can hear your questions and, um, and talk to you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my entire screen. All right, now, okay, is that working? We are full screen and ready to go. Awesome, cool. So I, I really, I first wanna start out, this is one of the freshwater springs. So the water here is flowing up from the underground aquifer, which we'll talk about again in a minute, but I wanna share with you guys first a really awesome experience I had this week. Um, so like I said, I've been swimming in these springs for the past eight years and uh, I had never had an experience like this at this particular spring before. So this is a Florida manatee, which is a subspecies of the West Indian manatee. And they come into the springs in the winter when the water in the ocean uh, goes below about 20 degrees Celsius. So about 70, 70 or 72 degrees um, Fahrenheit. And so the manatees uh, are related to dugongs, which are both Cyrenians, and they are the only two herbivorous marine mammals. And there's just so much fun to see when you come in the spring. And this was a complete surprise 
So we're going to zoom in a little bit and you can now see the manatee's teeth a little bit better. And manatees can eat actually 10% of their body weight in plants every day. And usually they can weigh about, you know, a thousand pounds. So a thousand pound manatee could eat about a hundred pounds of plants per day. And the teeth, you can sort of see them here. They're kind of neat because instead of having like baby teeth that would fall out like us that get replaced by permanent teeth later, they actually have what's called marching molars and new teeth are formed in the back of their jaw and then they move forward as their old molars in the front wear down. Because when they eat a lot of the plants, they have sand and stuff in them. So it will break down their teeth pretty easily. Um, and elephants have this same tooth replacement system, but elephants only have a lim num limited number of teeth, whereas manatees have an endless supply of teeth that kind of keep coming from the back. So kind of weird, but also super cool. So speaking of elephants, um, if you see here, you can look at the flipper and what you, I don't know if this kind of reminds you of anything, you can see those sort of toenail like vestiges on there. And elephants are actually the closest living relatives to manatees. And you can see if you look closely uh, at the elephant's feet, it kind of looks similar to the manatee. And what's really cool is this manatee was very curious. <laughs> and this is me here. You see, I just turned my camera around because she kept swimming up behind me. And I, I was like, maybe she's checking to make sure I got a good picture. Or, you know, she could see herself in the front of the um, dome on my camera because it's, it's reflective. It's made out of glass and she can see. Um, and she just was, was very curious. And if you're calm in the water with them and you don't approach them and they approach you, it's okay. So you can never go up and touch a manatee. But I was just floating there and she kept coming up and, and kind of nosing me or looking at my camera. So she, she was very, very curious. And what happened at the end of our encounter that I was super excited about was I got this picture of the, the manatee kind of flying in the sky here. And this is where, you know, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, about research and planning and thinking of images. So I'd had an image like this in my mind for a long time, but the problem is you have to wait until winter time when the manatees come into the springs. And you also have to be in clear enough and deep enough water for this to happen. So most manatee interactions people have um, will be somewhere called uh, Crystal River, Florida, and you can go to Three Sisters Springs and the water's kind of murky and it's shallow. And so you wouldn't be able to get underneath a manatee like this. I um, mean, you wouldn't want to startle them either. So you can't really scuba dive around them. So this was the manatee that had gotten really comfortable with me. And I went down to the bottom just to hold my breath and she got curious. So she swam over me and um, into the sky. And so this image was kind of, you know, I was thinking of it for the past eight years. And so it's not, it's not perfect yet. And I will you know, still keep working on it, but it was really cool to be able to experience a manatee at this particular spring. So when it rained a lot, the river got really dark. And what happened was this was the only really clear spring along that river and the manatees need that clear warm water. So they ended up being in a spring where I had never seen them for the past, um, in the past number of years. So manatees are, were listed as endangered and now they are, they got downlisted to threatened a couple years ago. And between about 2011, Okay, I think we lost Jenny's sound for a second. So we're just going to wait a minute and see if uh, the sound comes back to us. She might have to exit and come back into the Hangout. But for whatever reason, we've lost her sound for a moment. I'll try and send her a message too and see if we can figure out where her sound went. Okay, so she just ducked out, which means she's gonna come back in uh, and join us and hopefully her sound's back and we can continue exactly where we just uh, left off with Jenny.
but sometimes the internet doesn't always cooperate. So we'll give her a second to get back in uh, and join us. I'm going to send Jenny a quick email as well, just in case she can't tell that we lost her. Okay, while we wait to see if Jenny can come back and join us, I just want to give a shout out to our classrooms who are viewing along on YouTube. Don't forget to use the chat sidebar on the right. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and send us in some questions. And then to our classrooms who are with us right now, we may as well do um, our classroom introductions while we wait uh, for Jenny to get back in and join us. So, Let's do that now. Let the classroom say hi while we wait, and then we won't have to do that uh, when Jenny's back in. So our first classroom, Mrs. Jeffrey's class, they're joining us from Bradford, Ontario. So here in Canada, not too far from me. Let's turn the microphone on, let them say good morning. How's it going, boys and girls? Good morning. Josh, you want the camera? <laughs> All right, there they are, awesome. Let's check in with our next class. So our next class, Mrs. Bosher's class, they're joining us from, where are they? There they are, from uh, Madison. I believe that's in Alabama. Let's turn their microphone on, see how they're doing this morning. Say how are we doing? Both? <laughs> All right, perfect. Let's check in with Mrs. Manners' class. So they are joining us. They're in Canada as well. They're just outside of North Bay in a place called Torbay. Uh, let's turn their microphone on, see how they're doing this morning. How's it going, boys and girls? We're actually from Newfoundland, not North Bay, Newfoundland. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me see here. Torbay, Newfoundland. Torbay, Newfoundland. Fair yeah. enough. Well, there's one in Ontario, too. Probably not as cool as the one in Newfoundland, though. Yeah. <laughs> no. <All right. laughs> Perfect. We have an even bigger spread than I thought. That's awesome. All right. Mrs. Deer's class are joining us from... Chesapeake in Virginia. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing. How are we doing, Virginia? Hey. All right, perfect. Mrs. Moore's class is joining us. They are in the US, they are in Alabama as well in Newmarket. Let's turn their microphone on, see how they're doing. How are we doing, boys? All right, awesome. And then our final class, Mrs. Reading's class, is joining us from New Jersey. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing this morning. How's it going, boys and girls? Hi! All right, perfect. All right, well, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous that maybe Jenny's having some real internet problems, and it's not just one that she can pop right in after. Let me see if she sent me a message recently. No new message. Let me try and call her again. Maybe if we can get her on the phone, we can see what's going on.
All right. Well, I do want to give uh, Jenny a little bit more time um, just to see if she's having trouble or what sometimes happens is she might be presenting and not even know that her internet blinked off on her. So she might be talking to her screen right now thinking that she's talking to us um, and have her phone turned off, which is a real bummer. Oh, there's Jenny. Oh no, have I gone out for a while? <laughs> you did, Jenny. Um, oh no, I'm so sorry. No. I don't know what's happening. Don't worry about it. It's, uh, internet does that sometimes. Um, we're just glad we didn't lose you for good. Yeah. And, yeah. When did when did I go away? What we, what's like? We lost you. You had just kind of shown the manatee from above, and you just started talking on the new picture where the manatee was kind of cruising along the bottom. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm so sorry. Oh no. Okay. No. Okay. That's okay. I figured you were probably presenting to nobody for a few minutes. Oh, I def oh, absolutely. I was just talking to the dog. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, if that happens again, uh -huh. I will shoot you an email right away or I'll try and FaceTime you. Yeah. Try. Okay. Yeah. If you try and FaceTime me. Um, okay. Awesome. And so I was just talking about the aquifers um, in Florida. So I don't know if you want me to just kind of gl like gloss over some of that or... Yeah, um, how much time I have left. Why don't we go say five to six minutes longer, so 925-ish, and then okay. we'll come to some Q&A. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I have I have so many other stories, but I don't think that I have time. So I'll just do the, do you, would you rather have me do the aquifers or, or the ocean stuff? Uh, let's stick with the spring stuff. Okay, okay, we'll stick with the springs. Okay, perfect. I'm so sorry, guys. No, it's okay. I'm sorry you had to talk to your computer for so long. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So I will go ahead and share again. Hopefully that won't happen again. So let's see. We'll go backwards a little bit. <laughs> but I am pretty jealous of your manatee encounter. That looked pretty awesome. It was so much fun. So this one is the the sad picture that follows the last one um, about how we need to be careful because we have with our boats, um, you know, our this is actually propeller scars on this manatee. And so the population of manatees did increase by about 2,000 between uh, 2,000 manatees between 2001 and 2016. So they changed from being listed as threatened to um, being listed as endangered to being listed as threatened. So that's a good thing for the manatees because their population is increasing. But uh, we still need to be really careful because the boats can cause these scars. And also you can see here that there's actually no vegetation in the water. And um, manatees, like we just learned, also rely on a lot of vegetation to sustain themselves to eat. So a lot of the springs have gone from looking like this and having this lush flowing green grass to looking like this. And this is actually the exact same spot one year apart in a spring called Blue Spring in Florida. And there are a lot of different things that are causing this decline in vegetation. Um, this one was actually particularly linked to uh, Hurricane Irma, which caused a dark layer of water to go over the spring for about a week. Um, but it's a larger problem in Florida and a lot of it has to do with changing rainfall and groundwater pumping and um, changes in salinity for springs that are along the coast. So different amounts of salt in the water and also changing dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, so there's a, a lot of different things so, that are tied to the water quality and also the water quantity that are causing this to happen. So like I said, the water is flowing out of the aquifer, but this can be kind of a really abstract and confusing concept. But I want to help you guys understand it because it's actually it's actually pretty easy to understand if you so if we look at a map, this is just of the United States, I'm sorry, Canada, um, <laughs> but we have the aquifers and these colors represent different types of rock. And I am down here in Florida and you can see the, the blue, this blue um, rock here is the Florida aquifer and it covers almost all of Florida and it goes kind of up into Georgia and South Carolina. Um, and so if we, I, if we look at the rock that underlies Florida, this is the rock that's underneath Florida, the limestone here on the right. And all an aquifer is, is just rock that's saturated with water. So I wanted to show you this comparison. I like to, to say limestone is kind of similar to Swiss cheese because when you first think about it, it's like, how could rock be saturated with water? But if you think about the rock as actually having holes or what we call it's porous, 
then the water can be in that rock and the rock can actually hold the water and that's all that an aquifer is. So underneath Florida, it largely looks like the limestone there on the right that's kind of like Swiss cheese. So if we look at Florida again and add in these, these all these little blue dots are places where water is flowing up from that aquifer to the springs. And these freshwater springs are, are what we've been seeing pictures of with the manatee. And I actually can dive down into these aquifers. And this is me on the left with my friend Leah. And we are about to go cave diving. And you can see that we have maybe some different gear than the people who you would like usually picture as a diver. So we have two regulators, which is a thing in our mouth. And then we have tanks on either side of our body. Um, and we have computers and we have actually special fins. So all of this, this gear just to dive down into the aquifer. And this is what it looks like once we get down there. So it's actually pitch dark, but when we bring down lights, you can see uh, that actually there's these beautiful colors that light up this limestone rock. And so some of the holes in the aquifer in, in the rock and the limestone are very small, but others like this are actually big enough for us to swim through. So half of the people in the US get their drinking water from, from groundwater. But in Florida, where I live, actually more than 90% of us do. And so I like to say that in Florida, we're, we're walking on water. So when we're swimming in this aquifer, we're swimming in our drinking water. So this, I'll go a little more quickly over this part so we can talk about the turtles. But this was basically just to show you this buoy is attached to the entrance to an underground cave system. And this is what it looks like from a bird's eye view. So that's the same buoy. And you can see that like dark circle there is the spring where the water's flowing up. Uh, but if you superimpose, if you put a cave map over the top, this is all the cave passage where you can't see from looking um, from looking at it from the, the surface. So when I go in that, that spring there, I can swim through all of these cave passageways. And what I did was I chose nine spots within the cave to make uh, 360 photos. So diving into the cave and then taking a 360 photo um, it, think about if you were to do Google Street View or and then do um, and you can kind of go you can go between photospheres that's what happens now in the underwater cave and so uh, this is what it looks like when I'm shooting these pictures so you can this is the underwater view of those same photos we just saw so you saw that dark water with the clear water this is the dark water from the river here the kind of like tannic colored brown water and then the clear water flowing from the spring and this is me with my camera shooting those images and when you're done, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the link to the virtual tour. So if you guys want to explore that after we're done, uh, that's the you can take a picture of that, or um, that's that's how you get to it. And these, this is when you stitch all the pictures together. And if you look really closely, you can see a diver there on the left for scale swimming through these passageways. So then I took some of the students out to the springs to take their own pictures. And you can see here when they're in the water, they can look down and see the entrance to the cave is just below this boy's knee here. And there was also the important thing was too that we learned about the springs, not just as a source of drinking water, but also as an ecosystem. So we are not the only people that rely on this water. Also things like this snake, and you can see all the vegetation down there and a little sunfish on the right barely coming up to the surface. And all of the students as part of the field trip are in the background. And also turtles. So the last story that I'll share with you guys is about freshwater turtles. And this was the highlight of, of the trip. And these these students, like you guys were, were um, ex and that's the same number of species as in the Amazon River Basin. And the Amazon River Basin is 2,000 times the size of the Santa Fe River Basin where I live. So this is a really big, um, what we call like a diversity hotspot for turtles, where there's just a lot of species in one area. Like this is one of the species. It's a loggerhead musk turtle, and it has really big jaws so that it can eat snails. This is a common snapping turtle, and usually they're pretty, um, they're out at night, and they're kind of cryptic, too. They're, they'll be there while you're swimming, but they're not going to hurt you. They kind of have a bad rap, but they will just kind of hang out on the edges, and um, you're actually lucky to see one when you do. And so I was out with some researchers here who are, are were capturing turtles for a study, so you should never actually touch the turtles in the wild, but this was these are some scientists that were doing some work, and I was working with them. But the real... Um, focus of our story here, the star of our story, is the Swanee Cooter, which up close you can see is pretty beautiful. Um, they have these really pretty yellow markings on their face and these kind of vibrant colored eyes. And this is a female Swanee Cooter. 
and they are vegetarian. So just like the manatee, they rely on uh, this kind of vast underwater salad bar to sustain them. And this is a very happy turtle in the Itchituckney River where there's a lot of these grasses left. But unfortunately, like I said, a lot of these places with grasses are, are starting to have some a lot of algae in them. And so the turtles are eating the algae, but we don't know what the nutrition of that is. And so this grass is starting to disappear. And so they'll, they are, I mean, this is really all they have left to eat in a lot of places, but we don't know if they can, it can actually sustain them. So these researchers have been going out and documenting turtles since 2004. And I've been working with them for the past about six or so years on a long-term story about the turtles in the springs. And so they'll go out and they will catch these turtles. Here's one of them reaching for one. They'll, they'll catch them. And then um, this is, uh, they'll put them in a canoe and then go back and then here they're putting in a pit tag which is basically just if you think about it, if you have a dog or a cat and it has a little a tag in it that when you bring it to the vet they can scan it that's exactly what they're doing here so they can go back every every year every couple months and see you know where is this turtle found last and how much did it weigh before and it's just a way to identify each turtle they'll measure them and see um, look at how much they're growing and then they'll release them back unharmed but we're, we're really kind of just concerned and that's why I've been working on this project long term because I want to um, understand how the turtles populations are going to fare as the amount of vegetation in springs decreases. So I don't think that we have time, but I was, I was going to talk about um, some projects I worked on in the dry tortugas planting coral. Um, and then also talk about um, when I was off in this island a couple months ago in Tahiti in the middle of the ocean. Um, but, um, I did like one last thing I, I briefly wanted to mention was that you probably noticed that a lot of people in my pictures who are scientists are women. And I think it's just really important to remember that even if you don't necessarily see someone that looks like you in science, it doesn't mean you shouldn't go for it. And that a lot of times um, women are pretty underrepresented, um, in conferences and in, on TV, um, when it comes to representing scientists, um, and so a lot of my stories really try to focus on women in science to inspire the next generation of, of female scientists. So with that, I will go ahead and, and take some questions. And I'm sorry that we missed the last part. I feel so bad. That's OK, Jenny. Uh, I thought for a second we were going to lose you as well. Your, your sound froze for about 10 seconds, but then it came back to us. So oh, good. the internet's yeah. cooperating at least. Yay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry we're missing out on the ocean stuff, but it just means we're gonna have to host you again. So okay. <laughs> no big deal. Um, and also it'd be wild to do something in the future, maybe as you're gearing up for a dive or something. I think that would be really cool. So we should think that about that. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, let's meet our classrooms. Let's start getting some questions going. Uh, those who are tuning in online, I can see there's lots of classrooms watching on YouTube. Let us know where you're watching from. I'll give you a shout out and then send us in some questions. But for now, let's get started with some of our live classrooms. So let us go back to, let's start off in Torbay, Newfoundland, not Ontario, where we're going to see some grade three students who are hanging out with us. And let's get their first question to start us off. So we're ready, grade threes. Is there any, you can see, look in here, make sure you can be seen. There you go. Okay. Why did you choose to become a photojournalist? That's a great question. So I always thought that I was going to be a scientist and I did grad school and I ended up partway through grad school realizing that there was so much fascinating science out there. Like there are brilliant researchers all over the world doing that work, um, but a lot of it doesn't get communicated. And so the, like one of the main goals of science besides, um, you know, learning new knowledge uh, is also sharing that knowledge. And so for me, I decided that since I had this, this understanding and background in science, I could start to actually tell these stories about scientists that would connect with the public and connect with other people rather than just having science go into these peer reviewed journals. And so for me, it was really a desire to, to share these stories and to share what these incredible people were doing um, all over the world. All right, great question to start us off. And I'm gonna give a quick shout out to two classes from Glendale, Wisconsin. Uh, Ms. Umar's class and Ms. Radcliffe's class are joining us and they're already sending in questions. So we'll grab some of those in a moment. Awesome. But let's go now. Let's go to Mrs. Reading's class, hanging out with us in New Jersey. Let's turn their microphone on um, and see if they have a question for us. So we're ready, grade threes. 
All right. Has climate change or humans impact manatee habitats? It's a great question. Um, so yes, uh, a lot of the places where the manatees are were in the springs, like we saw there, um, they used to have these really flowing green grasses and now it's filled with algae. And so, uh, you know, some of that is definitely due to humans. And one thing I saw with Hurricane Irma that, that came and kind of smashed a lot of Florida was that a lot of the grasses disappeared when this dark layer of water covered over the spring. And so after that, the, the grasses couldn't photosynthesize, so they died. And unfortunately, uh, with climate change, one of the forecasts is that there could be more frequent and um, bigger storms. And so we're hoping that in Florida, you know, when, when those bigger, bigger storms come, that we don't end up um, losing, losing more uh, of the vegetation in our springs. Um, so yeah, definitely reducing the impacts of, of climate change will be huge in terms of um, saving our fresh water. All right, let's take a trip now. Let's go to Mrs. Moore's class. Fifth graders hanging out with us in Newmarket, Alabama. Uh, let's turn their microphone on and steal a question. All right, we're ready. What, what was your favorite project that you've worked on? Ooh, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, let's see. Well... I think probably the, my favorite thing I've done so far is shoot the, the 360 virtual tour in, in the aquifer, which is something that I did as part of a National Geographic grant a couple years ago. And that was the, the one that I showed you guys um, in the Freshwater Springs. And I think one reason is because it's close to home. And I think that telling stories and working on projects in our own backyard is something that's really powerful and something that you guys should all feel empowered to do. Um, you don't have to travel across the world. Like one of the stories I was going to show you at the end was from Tahiti, from, uh, French Polynesia. And I, I love traveling and experiencing other cultures, but I think that being able to work at home and um, in an area that you're familiar with and you have, have such a direct connection to was really powerful. And also to see students like you guys go in the water and experience their drinking water for the first time was just really incredible. And to see their eyes light up and to allow them. So they had cameras in the water too. And so I really liked being able to share the experience of photography with them. And I mean, I love sharing my own photos, but just being in the water with students, taking their own pictures and telling their own stories was, was so much fun. All right, great question. Let's steal a question from the online community. So let's see, our class in Wisconsin, uh, let's take one from each of their classes. So like a two-parter, they're wondering, is your job ever dangerous? And then the other class wants to know about the biggest turtle you've seen. The biggest turtle I've seen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, is my job ever dangerous? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we just had some feedback from a microphone, but I got it. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so so I think um, probably the the most um, dangerous part of the job is I don't know. I, I I think that cave diving can be considered kind of dangerous, and this is not a subject that I often talk about with my family because they do get nervous. Uh, but I think that you know there's a lot of risks that you end up taking when you travel and when you go diving or when you travel to unfamiliar places. But I think that it's it's something that we think a lot about, and by by planning and researching and doing your homework beforehand, and with uh, you know you can run into a lot lot less problems. Um, one of the the biggest dangers actually, we had traveled all the way to Iceland and um, you know spent about a week there, and we went diving in glacial water. So you might think that's the most dangerous part of it. It was freezing. It was just above freezing. And then our van actually ended up getting blown off the road by a, a huge gust of wind. So it's oftentimes not the first thing you expect to be to be dangerous. You know, riding in the car can often be more dangerous than cave diving. So it's really about planning and um, looking out for the weather a lot of times that, that can be can be the most dangerous thing. Um, and then for the turtle, the biggest turtle I've ever seen is is that turtle that I showed you guys the picture of with the scientist holding it, it by the side. And I don't know how much that particular one weighed, but some of the alligator snapping turtles in uh, the Suwannee River can weigh up to 44 pounds. So it's like a dog size. <laughs> All right, definitely big for a freshwater turtle. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a trip to Mrs. Bosher's class. Let's get their microphone turned on. 
Uh, they're joining us from Alabama as well. And if you're ready, go ahead with a question. Um, what, are some, what are some tips on how to get the best pictures that you can? Oh, great question. So the number one thing I always say for people, if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna do underwater photography is to get really comfortable in the water first. So after I did my diving certification and especially my cave diving certification, I just spent so much time in the water without a camera uh, first to just to get comfortable because you have to have your body position really, um, you know, really settled in the water. And I can show you the camera that I'm using to take these pictures. And so this is the camera that we end up using. And so it's, it's really big. And this is the glass at the front where you can see the, um, the camera takes the picture through there. And we bring this whole thing underwater. So you can imagine if you're trying to swim with this, that you need to be really comfortable um, swimming first. So, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is that you um, underwater need to get really close to things. So unlike above water where you could put on, you know, sometimes you see pictures of uh, wildlife photographers with those lenses that are, you know, a couple feet long. Underwater, we can't zoom in and you wanna actually have like the least amount of water between you and your subject. So you need to get very close. So you need to research the behaviors of the animal. And so a big part of um, my work is actually beforehand um, is researching, reading a lot of scientific papers, working with other biologists to understand um, how animals move and where they're going to be and where you can find them um, and also how to act around them so that they they act naturally you don't want a picture of a turtle that's swimming away at 90 miles an hour um, so yeah making sure you can get close and, and understand how to not not harm the animal or scare the animal in its, its um, habitat as well because you're kind of swimming into its home all right perfect tips to get started <laughs> Uh, let's see mrs. Jeffrey's class in Bradford Ontario your microphone is on <coughs> How old were you when you started diving? Oh, good question. So actually, I was um, I was in college. So I was my sophomore. It was before my second year of college. And um, I had been in the water my whole life. I grew up sailing, actually. And I was on a sailing team in college. And I just kind of thought that, that sailing, was, sailing and marine biology were going to be my whole life. And um, I learned to breathe underwater right before I, I signed up to go abroad on a trip to, I've lived at a research station in the Turks and Caicos for a semester. So I learned to dive before going there to do some research and that kind of changed changed my whole world. And so I think you can get certified as early as 12, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a junior certification. Um, so if any of you guys are interested, you can do that when you're as young as 12, but you can also, um, you can it's snorkeling like a lot of my pictures are, are taken snorkeling still so all you need is a, a mask and a snorkel to be able to see underneath the surface and there's so much that you can see still um, without actually diving down and breathing underwater all right perfect uh mrs deer's class chesapeake virginia your microphone is on what is the most concerning thing you've learned about the sorry i missed the last part the most concerning thing about the Spring. Springs. Oh, oh. So the most concerning thing has definitely been this um, shift to the in increase in the amount of algae in the springs. And it's something that um, scientists are, are studying a lot right now. But I think one of the most frustrating things has been, uh, especially as someone who's a scientist turned communicator, is. Oh, am I frozen? No, you're still good. Oh, now you're frozen. Okay, looks like Jenny froze, but she knows she froze, which means she'll be back with us. Uh, Sorry, oh, I'm back. <laughs> yep, I was like, once your face is all froze, I was like, oh, this is not good. Um, <laughs> That's okay, yeah. quick one. you came back quick, so no okay. worries. Perfect, do you want me to, I, I can answer that question, sorry. Sure. Um, sorry about that. So uh, yeah, I think one of the, there's a lot of scientists that are working on the springs right now. And so the most concerning thing, I don't know if this part came through, was just that there's this increasing amount of algae in, in the water. And it, unfortunately, like so many ecological problems, it's, it's very complex. And so I think a lot of times people want one solution that's going to that's gonna cause these springs to go back to how they were before. And unfortunately, that's not how it works. And so what we need, um, which it, it has been something that's been concerning, but also 
um, exciting is that people that in the general public don't really understand like what's causing this decline in the springs, but it's also a huge opportunity because, because scientists aren't exactly positive either. We have some ideas and things that we could do to help improve the springs, but it's really this disconnect between the people and, um, between the, the science that we know. And so I think there's this huge opportunity for us to be able to com communicate better about our water and to kind of help reconnect people to our fresh water. So that's where we look for people like you guys to help when we see these huge environmental problems, um, help communicate and help get the word out and you know become the next generation of people who are, are gonna help solve these huge environmental problems. All right. Um... Big shout out to Ms. Trout's class who's joining us from Ephrata, Pennsylvania. So if you have a question, there's still time to squeeze one in, but let's visit a couple more of our live classrooms. So uh, boys and girls, if we need to visit your classroom again, give me a big wave um, and I'll come back and try and visit as many as we can. That's what I thought, <laughs> lots of waving. So let's start <laughs> this is readings group. Your microphone is on. We learned about groundwater in our group first. Does Florida have a high water table and why? Oh, good question. So Florida's um, aquifer is really unique in that when it rains are in certain areas, especially um, where the aquifer is more open, um, where, where water can actually seep down into the ground in these recharge areas. So on the one hand, that makes our aquifer very um, susceptible to pollution because in those areas where water can get down into the aquifer to, to bring the water table up, um, pollutants and stuff can also get in there. So we have to be really careful in those areas, especially what we put on the ground. Like if we're putting um, fertilizer or chemicals or oil or, or anything on that water. Um, so Florida's water table is interesting because it kind of really fluctuates based, based on rainfall and based on how much water we pump out of the ground. All right, really good question. Let's swing back to Mrs. Jeffrey's class. Your microphone is on. Thank you. What was your favorite subject in school? Oh, biology. Yeah, I always really loved biology. Um, and so, I, I mean, like I said, I really just always thought that I would be a marine biologist. And, um, you know, I went through all the stages. I first wanted to study I think like, like, I don't know, sand dollars or starfish. And then, you know, I did what every marine biologist does and wanted to study sea turtles because um, everyone wants to study these big, um, big marine creatures like the charismatic ones. Um, but I always loved biology in school and um, I took AP biology my junior year of high school. And I think that really solidified for me that I wanted to study marine biology in college. All right, excellent choice. Uh, Mrs. Manners class, go back to Newfoundland. Do you guys have another question? Hey, Rod, I've got a question. Uh, I yeah, Tamara. Have you worked with Mike Gill before? She wanted have to I know Mike Gill. It's another person we did a Google Hangout with. Oh, cool. No, I haven't, but maybe, maybe someday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, all right, very cool. So Mike is another Nat Geo Explorer, but he's on the West Coast. He does a lot of coral oh, reef stuff and awesome. fish behavior. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Moore's class, your microphone is on again. Um, I was wondering, what is your favorite sea animal? Oh, my favorite sea animal. Um, ooh, that's a tough one too. Um, well, I've never seen one in real life, but I would love to see a narwhal someday. Um, I think those are super cool. Um, but in terms of my favorite one that. <laughs> that I've seen that's kind of overlooked and doesn't always get a lot of attention. Um, I really love sand dollars. Um, and I know it doesn't sound like that that awesome, <laughs> but I mean, when I was little, we used to snorkel on a sandbar and, and collect the, the dead ones. Um, and so it's kind of one of my earliest uh, water memories is looking for sand dollars in a place called Sand Dollar Cove. Um, and so they're kind of cool. They're, they're echinoderms. And so they're related to like, uh, to starfish and um, sea urchins and stuff like that. It's kind of like a flattened sea urchin. So if you read about them, they're actually, they're actually kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, so there we go. There's a little homework for after the hangout is to find out more about sand dollars. Uh, Ms. Bosher's class, your microphone is on again. If you lived in Alabama, yeah, nice and loud for us. If you lived in Alabama, what would you, what would you be likely to photograph? 
Alabama. Oh, lived in Alabama. Oh, cool. So I actually have some friends that have done quite a bit of work in Alabama, um, and they do a lot in the freshwater rivers. You guys have beautiful rivers there and some endangered um, fish species, especially small fish species. So I think you guys were the ones that asked me for photo tips too. And um, look for like small things. Um, I don't do a lot of macro photography, but some of my friends do. And um, or look for things, and also just things in your backyard, like I said. And so you guys definitely have incredible rivers, incredible wilderness. Um, I think you also have some really nice forests in Alabama, no? Um, so I mean, I guess I'm biased because I, I like to do outdoor um, photography. <laughs> but for me, I would I would probably jump into some of your freshwater water rivers. All right, very cool. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for overcoming the technology with us and sharing with us some of your adventures exploring uh, the freshwater springs in the Florida area, and especially some of the uh, the challenges they're facing, as well as the research that you do there. So that was really cool to have you joining us today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for hosting, and thank you for your awesome questions. I always super look forward to that at the end. So thank you guys for tuning in. I, I yeah, I really love this. Awesome. Well, we're just gonna have to steal you again so we get the ocean side of things. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn on all the microphones, let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. So boys and girls, you can get nice and loud if you want, and then we will sign off for today. So here we go. Microphones are coming on, and go ahead when you're ready. <laughs> All right, always never let us down. Uh, so we are jumping on another hangout at 11 with Sarah Pope. She's going to talk about some of uh, her journeys in Africa in about an hour, 10 minutes. So we hope to see some of your classrooms there. Otherwise, take a look at natgeo.org uh, and you will find uh, Explore Classroom under the education section. You can see some of our upcoming events. So Jenny, again, thank you so much for hanging out and we look forward to the next time we can steal you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye, Joe. All right. See you, everybody. Bye.